Welcome to the Helping Leaders and High Potential of Holy Derailment webinar, which will be presented today by Bill Gentry of the Center for Creative Leadership. My name is Tracy Dobbins. I'm an event manager at the Center for Creative Leadership, also known as CCL, and I will serve as the host for today's webinar. For more than four decades, CCL has leveraged the power of leadership to drive the results that matter the most to you. As a global provider of leadership development solutions and innovative research, CCL has been consistently ranked by clients as one of the top executive education institutions in the Financial Times for 14 consecutive years. We hope you'll enjoy today's session and find it a valuable leadership development tool for you and your organization. Today's program will last 60 minutes, but before I turn the meeting over to Bill, I'd like to just give you a few tips to help you get the most out of today's webinar. We invite you to interact with us utilizing the chat tool provided on the right side of your screen. You may use the chat feature to submit questions, or if you need clarification on an issue, just enter your question or comment uh, to the all participants. You can also engage with us utilizing the chat feature located on the right corner. We have included um, in your confirmation email, we have included some course materials, and we hope you have printed these out. Materials include information about the presenter, a copy of the presentation, as well as additional resources. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Bill Gentry. Bill uses his quantitative and qualitative research skills to examine what leaders, particularly first-time managers, can do to be successful in their work and life and to avoid derailment. His research interests are in multi-source 360 research, survey development and analysis, leadership and leadership development across cultures, leader character and integrity, mentoring, managerial derailment, and in the area of organizational politics and political skill in the workplace. Bill has more than 70 academic presentations and has published more than 40 articles in such journals as Journals of Applied Psychology, Personnel Psychology, and Leadership Quarterly. In addition, his research on first-time managers, leader character and integrity, political skill and derailment in the workplace has been featured in more than 50 internet and newspaper outlets, including Chief Learning Officer, ChiefExecutive.net, Forbes.com, and Wall Street Journal Online, at work, and CCL.com. Bill, welcome to the series today. Yes, it's great to be here, so thank you for, for having me. Talking all about uh, some things that I've been researching since I've been here at CCL for the last 10 years, uh, derailment, and uh, how to help people avoid it as well. Uh, some things that we want to make sure that we go over today, four main things I want to try to get out uh, to, to make everybody aware of and to help uh, leaders. Uh, we want to go over why frontline entry-level supervisors and managers, why they are so important, why they are part of your pipeline, and why, in my opinion, we want to try to build the case for you to see how important they are to your leadership pipeline. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about uh, generational differences and what you actually might find out they're more similar uh, than they are different. We'll touch on that. Uh, thirdly, I want to talk about what derailment is and the five behaviors that trip up uh, leaders so often that uh, that would lead to most likely them uh, derailing. And then finally, uh, it's not just about the research. Now, I'm, I am a researcher here, and I talk about research, and I do research here, but it's not just about the research. It's how can we use that research to, to help leaders who are uh, about to go through derailment, uh, to help them get off the track of derailment, and then just to help leaders uh, avoid derailment um, entirely. So turning that research into practice and giving you some practical, actionable tips, whether you are a leader or you are someone who tries to develop leaders and works with them, mentors them, develops them. I also like to uh, keep in touch with you all uh, as, as time goes by in the future. Uh, please follow me on Twitter at lead underscore better. You can follow CCL on Twitter at CCL.org. Love to follow this conversation online using the hashtag uh, Leadership Pipeline and First Time Manager as well. We'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions, and, and it's a great way for, for me and others uh, to keep talking about this important, uh, you know, uh, this important subject matter on derailment and helping our people uh, no matter where they are on the leadership pipeline. So to start off, why why have I been interested in first time managers? Why should there even be interest in organizations in these first time managers who so often are at the entry level of organizations in the leadership pipeline? Well, if you think about what DDI and the Conference Board recently found in a, in a study, they said that human capital is one of the CEO's top challenges. So they uh, uh, surveyed all sorts of CEOs across different organizations. They found that one of the biggest challenges CEOs have right now 
is human capital. And they are actually focusing on the entry level of leadership, your entry level of your leadership pipeline. These first level managers, these are your frontline supervisors, entry level supervisors, uh, um, uh, people who are managing individual contributors, and so many of them are managing for the first time in their life right now. And as you see, these are the biggest population of leadership organization. They are your future pipeline. They, and because they are there, they are, they lead the majority of the workforce. They need more people than any other level in the organization. Because of that, they have so much impact on different things that uh, organizations are really focusing on right now. They have the biggest impact on customer satisfaction, on employee engagement, on team productivity. Uh, they are your best strength, and they are your next generation of leaders. So they're the biggest population of leaders, and they have so much in terms of leading other people, so much responsibility for leading others, and biggest impact on so many key metrics that many organizations focus on. So if they're so important, we say, well, let's shine the spotlight on them. Let's train and develop them. So let's do that. Well, if you think about any time you've ever done things for the first time, think about the first time you ever drove a car. Think about the first time you've learned a new computer program. Uh, think about the uh, new parents who've never uh, had a baby before. They, uh, or think about people who are about to be married for the first time. They usually have some sort of class. They have some sort of manual. They have some sort of... Uh, development, they have some sort of way for them to understand what they are about to go through as they step into this new thing that they've never done before. So again, whether it's driving, whether it's uh, being a parent, whether it's uh, being a, a husband, wife, partner, there are all sorts of different ways that they get development, all sorts of different ways they find out what's going to happen or what it's going to be like when they do this new thing for the first time. But however, it's not that way for leadership. Almost 60% of people who get promoted from an individual contributor to a leader, they never get any training, they never get any development at all. Almost 60%, a majority of people. And in fact, if you think about the people, the minority, the 40% or so who actually do get some sort of training and development when they step up to be a manager for the first time in their life, they get way less in terms of money compared to middle-level managers or senior-level executives who have way more experience, way more tenure, uh, that much more uh, knowledgeable about what leadership is. So to me, uh, to quote uh, from the movie The Princess Bride, that's inconceivable to me. Uh, it is so inconceivable to me to have the biggest population of leaders, the most important part of your leadership pipeline, get the least amount of support and development. It feels like that we're setting them up for success. And what happens? Well, if, if, you, if, if, if all these statistics are holding out and, and are true, no wonder why this occurs. If you think about it, 82% of frontline leaders, where many first-time managers are, they are not seen as excellent in their skills and abilities. Almost 40% uh, of newly promoted managers failed in the first 18 months. Uh, the research I've done here at CCL, we, we've seen that one out of two managers are seen as incompetent, a disappointment, a wrong hire, or a complete failure by their coworkers. 20% of first-time managers do a poor job, and 26% of first-time managers felt they were not ready to lead others. So, again, no wonder why these uh, stats are out there. We're, it feels like we're setting these people who are at the entry levels of leadership, we're setting them up for failure instead of setting them up for success. And what happens when all these uh, things occur? Well, no wonder, as we see, that DDI found that 25% of organizations report a loss in profit due to poor frontline leaders. 50% reported turnover of leaders or team members. 65% report a loss in productivity. And 69% report a loss of engagement due to poor frontline leaders. So, again, biggest population of leaders, most important to all sorts of different key metrics that your organization is, is, uh, is really focusing on. But if we're not setting them up for success, no wonder why we're setting them up for failure. And you can see all these uh, poor frontline leaders and what happens. No wonder I hear that so many people in organizations talk about their bench being uh, being depleted, or they're having a dead bench, or they're not ready for uh, for the future leaders in their organization because they feel like their bench strength and their bench is pretty barren. So that's what those numbers are really uh, are keying in on. For me, when I think about people who are at that entry level of leadership and stepping up from an individual contributor to your first leadership role, I found that becoming a manager for the first time in your life is no doubt one of the biggest psychological and emotional shifts you're ever going to experience in your career. And it's totally different than what you do in your normal, everyday work. For individual contributors, it's all about their technical savvy, their technical skill. And when they step up in a leadership, it's so much different. And it's such a big shift that they have a difficult time in making that. 
And to me, as I said before, it's inconceivable because if it is the biggest shift they have to make in their career, we are not setting them up for success. Well, so many people think that if we're focused on these first-level managers, these entry-level supervisors, the frontline leaders of your organization, it's not really a, a leadership pipeline thing. It's really a, a generational thing because so many of them are younger. So many of them uh, are these uh, millennials that are in the organization, and they are so different from everybody else in the organization. That's why we're having a tough time. So uh, when I talk to people about leadership pipeline issues, this is one thing that constantly comes up. It's all about this younger generation, this millennial leader that's so different from everybody else. So what can we do about that? Well, what I want to try to uh, have us understand is what we think about when we actually hear the word millennial, and I want to tell you some, some things in the research side that might actually change your mind about what these millennials are. If you think about who millennials are in the workplace right now, they're in their 20s to early 30s. Um, stereotypically, they've, they've had these, you know, helicopter parents who have been over them all of their growing uh, lives and their, as kids and as, as young adults. Uh, be, and because of that, it's very hard for millennials to take criticism. They always want a trophy, that participation trophy. They always want that. They want constant acclaim. They feel entitled. Uh, they're, they're very self-centered, narcissistic. They're, they're these workplace divas in our organization. Uh, many times millennials are characterized as being social media savvy and so much so that they can't keep their personal and professional lives separate. They're always on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, or any other social media uh, aspect in their, in their, uh, on their work phones, their iPhones, and their computers while they are at work at the same time. They need their devices more than anybody else. That's what a lot of people think. They can't have their iPhones away from them for more than five seconds. Uh, they're, they're also seen as socially conscious. You know, these millennials want to save the world. And many believe that because of that, they will leave a job if the job doesn't fulfill their passions. And many believe that they have different career goals than, say, Gen Xers or baby boomers who are older generations in the workplace. And then finally, uh, many people believe that stereotypically millennials want something different from their leaders. So that's kind of how the, the popular media and pop psychology has really characterized who millennials are. And what I want to try to do is, is tell you about the research and tell you what the truth is behind these generational differences. What the research says, what it tends to say, is instead of uh, uh, being that there are differences, the truth out there in terms of the research is that there are no differences amongst generations. There are really hardly any sizable differences between millennials and Gen Xers and baby boomers. I'm going to give you an overview of three different areas that I've found this research to be true. IBM did a study uh, a few months ago, uh, 1,784 uh, employees across a dozen countries and several different industries, and they found that millennials and baby boomers and Gen Xers, they tend to be more similar than different. So first off, how about their career aspirations? You know, uh, We see that uh, millennials actually have similar career aspirations than do other generations. What IBM found was Millennials have a desire for financial security and seniority, just like Gen Xers, just like baby boomers. And in fact, older groups want to work with others just as much as millennials do as well. So they have similar career aspirations. Secondly, millennials don't really want a trophy. What they really want is a leader who's ethical and fair. They don't really need a leader who's going to hand out a participation trophy all the time. They really want a leader who's ethical and fair, just like baby boomers, just like Gen Xers. In fact, older groups have similar views to millennials in terms of recognition and accomplishment, and they want performance-based uh, recognitions and promotions just like older groups as well. So they don't really want a trophy. They really want the same type of things as their leader. You know, they do want recognition, but so do other generations. They also want a fair and ethical leader. So do to other generations. Third, uh, millennials don't really want to do everything online and virtually. You know, they have these iPhones. They have... Uh, their, their devices, but what we, what IBM found uh, in their research is when it comes to training and development, they want the same sort of things as Gen Xers and as baby boomers, and in fact, they all want things that are more face-to-face, one-on-one when it comes to training and development. It's not about having these, uh, these media-savvy, uh, computer-savvy uh, online programs. They really want things that are face-to-face when it comes to development. When they want to learn something new, they want something face-to-face. Fourth, uh, many times people think that millennials have to crowdsource. They have to ask everybody. They have to 
put a poll up on Twitter and find out what the what the answer is. Well, they actually found that millennials don't crowdsource, and they can actually make decisions on their own. They tend to solicit advice from coworkers just as much as other generations do. And finally, what IBM found was millennials will leave their organization for the same reason as other generations. You know, many people think that millennials are socially conscious. That's what's going to make them leave organizations if that organization doesn't fulfill their their roles or the, the way that they want to change the world. Well, in some cases that's true, but millennials are just as likely to leave as baby boomers and Gen Xers when it comes to getting ahead or entering the fast lane or making money. And if you think about it, a lot of these millennials who just graduated from college, they are hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, and they need jobs in order to pay off that debt. So they will leave that organization if they actually find a job that's better for them that pays more, just like a Gen Xer employee would just like a baby boomer employee would. So the big takeaway from this IBM study, millennials want pretty much the same thing as other employees want. They want ethical and fair boss. They want inspirational leadership. They want an opportunity to move ahead in their careers. So any differences tend to be rather small. That's what the IBM study found. There's also a, a, a stream of research out there that has looked at many, many uh, academic articles and have kind of... Uh, what they call meta-analysis, which is pretty much uh, what uh, Costanza researcher did and, and his team looked at all different studies that have looked at generational differences and kind of put it into a, a statistical program and then out comes the output to tell you kind of what the overall, you know, findings are based on these studies. And they found actually 20 studies with close to 20,000 people that have looked at the relationships between generations and work outcomes. And what they found was, over and over again, when when the final kind of uh, relationship came out across all of these studies, there was really no difference in terms of what generations wanted and uh, the work-related outcomes. So uh, generations did not describe any difference in terms of job satisfaction. Being a, in a generational cohort uh, didn't describe any differences when it came to organizational commitment or turnover intention. The results do not support any systematic substantive differences amongst generations when it came to those job attitudes. Finally, here at CCL, we've done a lot of research. Jennifer Deal has been great in terms of leading this, uh, leading the research in terms of generational differences or what we tend to see is generational similarities. Uh, Jennifer and I, along with a few others at CCL, we actually found that there were no differences in what makes a leader effective. Gen Xers, baby boomers, and millennials tend to see that what makes a leader effective is the same, participative, team-oriented, charismatic, and humane-oriented. Uh, Jennifer and I, along with a couple others a few years ago, actually found that when it came to attitudes and beliefs and preferences about development at work, there really were no differences across the generations when it came to that. We also found that there are no differences amongst generations when it came to leadership development tendencies. Uh, if one generation tended to have uh, a behavior or characteristic that led them to derail, the other generations tended to have that same characteristic as well. We found mostly no differences in terms of uh, generation when it came to leadership competency. So, for instance, if there was a leadership competency that was important for one generation, it was important for all of them. And finally, level of the organization tended to explain motivation more than generation. So it's less being a Gen Xer or a baby boomer or a millennial when it comes to being motivated at work. It's more about where are you in the leadership pipeline. And that's when we really talk about, well, it's younger managers, these millennials, they're so different. It's not really that. Um, it's, it's really uh, the wrong way to think about it. It's really to think about, let's look at the leadership pipeline in general, and where are you in a leadership pipeline? And for so many of them, on that leadership pipeline, the, the biggest population of leaders, as I said before, there's that entry-level, front-line, uh, first-level supervisor or manager. So many of them are leading for the first time. So many of them have been excellent chemists or excellent IT people or excellent engineers or excellent salespeople. They've been so good at their technical savvy, their technical skill, their smarts. Uh, they've brought in the numbers. They've met the numbers. They've exceeded the numbers. And because of that, they get promoted into leadership for the first time. And for so many of them, they rely on those skills that got them promoted into leadership. But what they find out is that's not really going to help them when they become leaders in organizations. Uh, so what do we need to do? Uh, for so many people, they need to think about their strengths, and for so many people, they need to think about weaknesses. When you step up into leadership, what sort of things should you focus on, strengths or weaknesses? Well, CCL, we tend to say focus on both. 
Um, because if you just focus on your strengths, focusing just on your strengths can hurt you. And we'll talk about that in a minute. If you just focus 100% of your uh, time on weaknesses, however, it can get you in a rut. I mean, think about putting all of your effort and all of your uh, emphasis on trying to improve upon a weakness or address your weakness. Uh, it can really get you in a rut and get you uh, thinking of very frustrated at times. So we want to tell you that you need to focus on both. Leverage your strengths to help you be effective, to maybe help you uh, leverage those weaknesses that you have, but you can't forget your weaknesses. You can't forget your weaknesses either. You have to address your weaknesses. So at CCO, we tend to say focus on both. But today, that's, uh, today what we're going to be focusing on when it comes to derailment is about weaknesses, okay? But as I say, don't forget your strengths either. So what derailment is? Well, our researchers, uh, Michael Gardner and Cindy McCauley, started looking at this back in the 80s. And what they uh, did was they actually looked at and interviewed many different successful executives and organizations. They asked those executives, you know, first off, they asked them, tell us about you. Tell, tell us how you got to be so successful in your organization, in your career. And based on those interviews, they bucketed those things, and, and they found these lessons of experience. Secondly, what they also asked these successful executives, they asked them, tell us about a person who had all the makings of being a successful executive, just like yourself. They could have even been CEO or president of the organization. But somehow their career flamed out, they burned out, they got demoted early, they got fired. Tell us what happened to that person. And that's what the Roman's all about. It occurs when a manager who is expected to go Hire the organization who is judged to do so has the ability to do so. That person was fired or demoted or plateaued way below expected levels of achievement. And based on those interviews, we, uh, they, they came up with several reasons why derailment occurs. First reason why is something that we kind of have no control over. You know, stuff happens. So some of the reasons leaders derail are beyond our control. So a, a downsizing, a merger, a reorganization, or just bad luck. Stuff happens in life, and these things that we have no control over, things that happen in our, in our organization that we had no control over, really derails our chances of being an effective leader. You know, I had a, a, a friend recently who was an executive VP in an organization. That organization merged, and they downsized, and that, and that person had to be let go. So nothing against him. It was just what happened in life that he had no control over. So his career has derailed now, and he has to try to find a new place to, to get that career started up again. So one of these things, you know, just, just stuff happens. We have no control. But the other thing to think about, too, when stuff happens, say that uh, stuff happens in your organization and you survive and you still have a job. Well, then you have to be able to change and adapt to make sure that you can make it in that new organization. So while some of these things are beyond your control, if something happens that's beyond your control and you're a survivor and you stay there, what are some things that you can do to make sure that you can change and you can adapt so that your, uh, so that your career doesn't derail? Second reason why uh, derailment occurs, success goes to our heads. You know, some of these, uh, and many of these individual contributors and these high potentials, they're so good and so successful at what they do, they've hardly gotten any constructive or even negative feedback, particularly to their faces. So whenever that happens, you know, they tend to get these big heads, these big egos, these feelings of invincibility. They start believing their own press clippings. And when some transition to leadership where they can't rely on those successes and those talents and that technical savvy, they can't rely on their press clippings anymore, it all falls apart and they can't make it as a leader. So success went to their heads and they just couldn't adjust because they just kept believing those press clippings and that feeling of invincibility, their career derailed. Thirdly, weaknesses were ignored and were never addressed. You know, our own weaknesses play a role in our inability to make it as leaders. You know, these weaknesses may have been overlooked at the beginning. They may have even worked in the beginning. But over time, they persisted, they were ignored, they were never addressed, and they eventually lead to derailment. Now, think about the person in your organization who gets things done by being insensitive and pushing people as hard as humanly possible, up to and beyond a tipping point. You know, they yell, they scream, they belittle, they berate, they abuse. They're bullies. And that's what makes them successful. They, it helps them make the numbers. It helps them exceed the numbers. It's how they got ahead. And, you know, in some cases, being a bully can actually, in, in very rare cases, actually work in organizations. Uh, professor Gerald Ferris, who's a business school professor at Florida State University, 
He and his colleagues believe that bullying can be effective at certain times and in certain situations. I can't stress that enough. If bullying is used infrequently, strategically, and for short-term improvement, so at those certain times and in those certain situations, it may be really useful to do that. But this is not, and they stress this as well, it's not an effective long-term a scenario to do. You can't be bullied long term. It's actually going to cause a dysfunctional work environment in the long run. Because the more bullying you do, the less satisfied people are in their jobs, the worse the victim's health, absentee rate, uh, rates of victims rise, as well as their intentions to leave the organization. And the long term effects of constant bullying can lead to decreased motivation, decreased morale, decreased satisfaction in jobs. So all that bullying and pushing and being insensitive is really part of a weakness that some leaders have. It definitely will not work as they move up the organization where you need artful influence and negotiation, perspective taking, and political savvy. So if you have that weakness and you don't address that weakness and it keeps persisting, it will derail you later on and it will catch up with you. The final reason why uh, derailment occurs, strengths become weaknesses. You know, strengths uh, that, that individual contributors have may become weaknesses later. Now, we all rely on our strengths. It's the thing that makes us really good at what we do. It makes us who we are. It makes us stand out from other people. It's what makes us subject matter experts and specialists and helps us get promoted in the leadership. You know, think about the, the kind of the trait or the, the characteristic of being independent. It's a strength that many individual uh, contributors have. You know, they can do things their own way. Uh, you know, I get things done because I can do all the things that I can do. The strengths like independence, which served us well as individual contributors, can become weaknesses later as you move up the leadership pipeline. So, for instance, when you become a leader, you have to start relying on others and working with others and managing teams. You need to focus less on yourself and more on others. So, while you're being lauded and praised for the independence that you had as an individual contributor, you're going to be criticized and vilified for it uh, as a leader. So, those strengths, if you keep on relying, it can become weaknesses later, and it will derail your career. So those are the four reasons why uh, many managers derail, and because of that, they tend to display certain behaviors or characteristics. And based on uh, uh, Macaulay Lombardo's research and the research that we've continued here at CCL for the past couple decades, we've actually seen that managers who derail tend to show certain behaviors, and you can spot them. And so this is where it, you, you can, if you're a manager yourself, you can kind of see, am I displaying these behaviors? If so, I might be on a track to derailment. If you're someone who's working with managers or developing managers, maybe you're a manager of managers, maybe you're a boss of somebody who might be going through this, maybe you're in HR and you need to try to plot a development scenario for, for, your, for your leaders in the workplace, these are things that you need your managers to be aware of to see if they are derailing, because if they are going to derail, that's going to be very costly to your organization. So the first behavior of derailed managers that we'll talk about is problems with interpersonal relationships. Now, I ask people about this, have, have you ever been called authoritarian or cold or aloof or arrogant or dictatorial or insensitive? Uh, do you make direct reports of peers feel stupid or unintelligent? Do you order people around rather than working to get them on board? Uh, one question I always ask that always kind of gets uh, the people's uh, attention really, uh, brought, uh, really lights up whenever I ask this, have you left a trail of bruised people behind you? Those are the types of things that people with problems with interpersonal relationships tend to have. So, for instance, like Rachel. Rachel, early in her career, she delivered impressive numbers, brought positive results, and succeeded where other individual, individual contributors failed as a sales rep. So her approach to work was very straightforward and practical. You know, it's kind of like that mantra, kick ass and take names. But she was so focused on achievements and results. That focus brought her success. But Rachel got promoted into leadership, and that attitude continued. And it's, and it continued when he started to manage others. Now, nobody wanted to really work for her and her abrasive style. So that's how problems with interpersonal relationships play out. The second behavior of derailed managers, difficulty leading a team. So, for instance, are you unable to form and staff and lead a team effectively? Are you unable to help individuals understand how their work fits into the goals of the organization? Uh, are you blind when it comes to having an eye for talent? Uh, do people not want to work for you? And can you handle conflict, or are you pretty bad at handling conflict amongst your team? So Terrence was a young engineer with a great track record. Uh, he could understand complicated technical problems, fix them really quickly, and because of that, he, he was very efficient. He even saved the organization a lot of money. And when he became a leader for the first time, 
his, t- his team complained about a lot of things. You know, Terrence couldn't provide structure. He wasn't transparent with things. He wasn't very, uh, he didn't communicate well. He didn't share information well. None of the team members knew Terrence's vision, what was expected of their roles. Some didn't even know what their roles were. And so none were actively engaged or motivated in their work because of that. That's what difficulty leading a team is all about. Third behavior of derailed managers is uh, difficulty changing or adapting. So do you have a difficult time learning about things not in your wheelhouse or not in your area of expertise? Or have people told you that you're setting your ways? Uh, have you been able to adapt to your culture of your organization? Can you adapt to the culture of being a manager or the management's culture there in your organization? Or do you resist learning from mistakes? You know, one of the things I've talked about before, one of the reasons why managers derail, you know, stuff happens. And as I've talked about before, if stuff happens and you are still working in that organization, are you able to change or adapt to what that organization is really about now? So this is kind of what, uh, this is one of the key behaviors of these derailed leaders. They are unable to do that. So it's kind of like what Chris. Chris was a star at sales and business development. She was so good with customer service and client relationships. That's what got her promoted. Um, but when she got promoted into that uh, new managerial role, she couldn't let go of those client relationships. She couldn't see that those clients were no longer her responsibility, but it was the responsibility of her direct reports. So she couldn't delegate well. She felt she had to take on everything uh, because that's really is that's what all that's all she, that she knew how to do. So she couldn't let go of the thing that she knew to do so well. And so her career derailed because of that. She wasn't able to change or adapt to this new management culture or what she needed to be as a manager and not as an individual contributor anymore. The fourth behavior of derailed managers is failure to meet business objectives. So have you been described as overly ambitious? You know, do you have great ideas, but do you like the follow-through to move those ideas towards completion? Do you overestimate your own abilities? Can you, in fact, achieve your goals as a leader of others and meet the obligations of the business? You know, Bradley couldn't. You know, Bradley, yes, he was outgoing, he was genuine, he was well-liked by everybody at the bank. He actually had a great vision of how he thought his team could revolutionary, uh, revolutionize the way loans were made. It can make a difference to the organization and the customers, too. But for all of his people skills, his ideas for increasing the business were stalled and were never realized. He overpromised and under- underdelivered. Uh, he would also start on projects that never followed through. He promised he would bring in revenue that just was not feasible. So he was unable to meet those business objectives, and his career derailed. The final uh, behavior of derailed managers I'll talk about that we found in our research, too narrow functional orientation. And this is the one I always wanted to end with when I talk to high potentials, when I talk to individual contributors, when I talk to first-time managers, when I talk to anybody who's interested in the leadership pipeline, and again, when I'm talking about that, I'm really concentrating on that entry-level, front-line, uh, first-level supervisor. Uh, this is the one that, uh, when, we, when we look at our research, it's the one that is the uh, has the highest uh, scores when it comes to derailment, meaning this is the one that really stands out. Uh, and I do this from a practical point of view, too, because it's so relevant and so true when you're stepping up into leadership. So all the technical skill in the world, all the knowledge of your area of expertise, it, it's so valued. And it's valued as an individual contributor. And if you just focus on that, it's not going to be valued as much as a leader. It's not going to compensate for the broader ability to lead others. It's just like Frank, who had such a depth of expertise as an actuary, but he didn't have enough experience with the people side of leading others. He didn't have the broader knowledge outside of his area of expertise with other parts of his insurance company, the industry, or the marketplace. He had a too narrow functional orientation. Again, this is the one that is the, uh, the biggest of the five in, in, in terms of our research that we find. And practically speaking, when I talk to a lot of people about leadership pipeline issues, particularly for those entry-level supervisors, this is the one that you really need to look out for, too narrow functional orientation. So displaying these behaviors makes a person more likely to derail. And it's not just one. It's all of them that can really come into play. Uh, think about this case study that I'll tell you about Melissa. Melissa's a real person. Um, Melissa excelled in high school, and she excelled in high school so much she was in all sorts of extracurricular activities. She, yes, she was uh, president of the Spanish club, and she was president of the debate team, and she was president and, and lead dancer on the dance team. And she got into a great college because of all of that. She received a bachelor's and master's in computer science. She specialized in artificial intelligence, so she was clearly bright. She even taught some classes while pursuing her degree. And after graduating, she started working at an upstart computer company, and it was, her, was the company's first female engineer. 
So Melissa became well-known in the small but growing organization. She was confident. She had discipline. She had drive, determination, rigor, attention to detail, a strong work ethic. Uh, she was very ambitious. She had a take-charge attitude. She had such great technical ability. She would spend countless hours in the office. You know, she'd work for 80 to 100 hours a week, and those hours paid off because she was the driving force behind so many patents that were important to the organization, and much of the company's improvement for user experience and skyrocketing growth could be attributed directly to her and her talent. And all this helped her in becoming a manager. Uh, she got her first managerial position as a product manager in the company. And when she got promoted, her reputation for thinking that, you know, the smartest and best shall rise to the top and those that don't deserve to fail, they were from her individual contributor days, that kept on lasting as she was a uh, manager. And she wanted people to outwork everybody. She now demanded that from everybody else. And she didn't think too highly of people who, had, who didn't adopt that same work ethic that she had as an individual contributor that she now had as a manager. She didn't have much patience with designers who didn't make choices based on data, she thought design was more science than art, so this made some uh, designers leave the organization. She thought excellence was at a meet expectations level, and a lot of people can't meet that expectation, so some of them left the organization too. You know, she actually did one thing that she thought was pretty novel and, and pretty genius of. Uh, of. She actually had office hours just like she did when she, was, uh, when she was in grad school, and it worked for her in grad school. It worked for her as a professor there in graduate school when she taught classes, so she thought, hey, this will work in my organization as well. So people had to sign up during those office hours for her time. Not only did her direct reports have to sign up for those, so did her peers as well. And many of her peers had more experience in the organization, uh, were just as smart as her, but they had to go through the motions of office hours as well. So Melissa thought, again, it was very innovative. But to many people in the organization, they saw that as emblematic of Melissa's high opinion of herself, her huge ego, and a way to show others her status and power. And it symbolized her inability to work in a very collaborative, concerted way with others. You know what also people found out when, when Melissa was in one-on-one -on -one or, or small group settings, people tend to describe her as cool and aloof. Uh, like a robot, wasn't able to really hold any eye contact with people. She had this reputation for not being able to play nice with others. So much of what Melissa did led to her being moved from the core business that she loved and had experience in to another part of the business, one that lacked a lot of the spotlight. And this move coincided with a reorganization, so some saw this as a lateral move, but for many they considered this a demotion. She stopped being included in meetings, was no longer part of the inner circle, and as a result, she eventually left the organization. So, yes, Melissa's career derailed. Now, you can probably see how the five derailing behaviors and the reasons people derail all played out in Melissa's story. And, yes, the reorg, she didn't have any control over, but she also let her ego get the best of her, didn't address her weaknesses, had strengths turn into weaknesses, and displayed many of those behaviors that derailed leaders, like I've talked about, problems with interpersonal relationships, to neurofunctional orientation and others. So I just want this story of Melissa to be a warning sign to you that can happen to anyone. As you might already tell, Melissa is actually Marissa, and Marissa is actually Marissa Mayer, uh, who is now the CEO of Yahoo. Uh, uh, Marissa Mayer was at that small upstart company called Google, and her career at Google did derail. She was bright. She was highly skilled. She was a hard worker. She thrived as an individual contributor. But her career as a leader derailed at Google because she wasn't able to think about all those reasons why you derail and wasn't really dealing with the problems uh, and the characteristics of those derailed leaders. So, as I want to, uh, the, the last part of the, the webinar I want to talk to you about today are we, we, we know from the research what are these characteristics and behaviors of derailed leaders, why do uh, leaders derail. Well, I want to give you some. Uh, tips and some advice based on our research as well as to what individuals can do themselves and what organizations can do to help those individuals. So first I want to look at what uh, individuals can do. You know, what does our research say about avoiding derailment? Well, there are five different things that I've been able to look at uh, over the years since I've been here at CCL that really uh, contribute to or predict whether somebody is going to derail or not. Uh, about self-awareness and willing to improve. It's about having political skill and having to manage those, uh, manage up and manage down and manage around the organization. And finally, something very recent is about empathy. So I want to talk about these uh, uh, step by step. First thing I want you to think about is what we found in our research, no matter where you are in the world, we found this in Asia, we found this in Europe, in Latin America, found this here in the States as well. 
those who are self-aware, they know their strengths, they know their weaknesses, uh, and they're wanting to improve. Uh, also, if you're really good at something and people also see you as good at something, all of those things are related to being less likely to derail. So if I think I'm really good at something and people also see me as good at, at, at that skill or ability as well, I'm going to be less likely to derail. So I have some sort of self-awareness around what I'm good at. I also know what I'm not particularly good at. And if I'm not good at something, I am willing to improve. we found that time and time again. If you're able to do that, you're going to be very uh, successful in your organization and not likely to derail. So some questions that I tell managers when they're thinking about this, you know, how well is your fit? How well is your fit in with your organization? Now, I'm an industrial organizational psychologist by trade, and one of the key things that I've seen in, in the IO literature is person environment fit. Do you fit in with your organization, and does the organization fit in with you? Do you fit in with your job demands? Uh, does do you fit in with your boss and your boss's managing style or leadership style? Do you fit in with the people around you? Do your values fit the organization? Does the organization's values fit you? Uh, all of those things are very important. Uh, do you enjoy the tasks that you do? Are you aware of certain things in your life right now, like boredom or work overload? Uh, do you get a lot of feedback, and do you believe that you can improve? Do you have the mindset of being able to improve? So when I talk to managers one-on-one -on -one or in small group settings, I ask them these questions. And if, they're, if, if they really fit in with their job and they're able to understand how they fit in with their job or their organization, they have great careers, they feel really positive about things, they want to improve in the things they want to do and they're less likely to derail. So as a manager yourself, I would tend to have you answer those questions and see whether you have a good fit in your organization, whether you're aware of things that are going on in your life, do you get the proper feedback? If you are somebody who helps develop managers or puts on training programs for managers or is involved in the career development of managers, I would tend to have these questions around and ask the managers that you're helping and developing and training, do they fit in with what the organization is? Having them understand that is going to be really helpful in terms of them derailing or not and to avoid derailment. Second thing that I, uh, based on the research that we've done here at CCL that I really uh, talk about is political skill. What we mean by political skill, uh, it's from, uh, again, Professor Ferris, who I talked about bullying uh, earlier um, uh, in the webinar. He also is what we, he's, he found like the father of political skill, and we, we've been able to use a lot of his work and adapt to us at CCL to really do some great research around what it means to be politically skilled or politically savvy. And we found that those with political skill tend to be seen as less likely to derail. And what political, political skill is all about is are you able to uh, function in organizations that are inherently political? Do you have the ability to understand yourself and understand other people and understand the environment around you and use all that in order to get goals? That's really what political skill is all about, understanding yourself, understanding others, using all of that knowledge, understanding the environment around you, and using all of that in order to obtain goals. And so we like to tell people a lot of that has to do with how do you read the environment? Can you read what upper management wants? Are you able to deal with the people uh, below you in the, in the leadership hierarchy? Can you manage up and manage down and manage around? Are you able to understand what upper management wants? Do you understand what motivates your direct reports? Can you read what's going on in the environment? Uh, can you have those networks that you have and understand how things get done and use your networks effectively? And can you make a good impression? Are you sincere? Are you authentic? Are you genuine in the things that you do? Do you have a lot of character? Do you have a lot of integrity? All of those things are so important. If you have those things, you're going to be seen as less likely to derail because you're able to get stuff done and you have really great, authentic, genuine connections with your peers and your direct reports and your boss's entire management. Finally, one of the um, uh, most recent things we've been able to find in our research here at CCL is the importance of empathy. You know, it's, it's having the ability to understand somebody else's perspective. And what we found recently, we, uh, we just got this paper accepted. It will be coming out in the next few months in the Journal of Leadership Quarterly. What we found was people who tend to be seen as more empathetic as leaders also tend to be seen as less likely to derail in their careers. So this whole empathy and this kind of soft skills of leadership, particularly on empathy, the ability to listen to others, understand others' perspectives, understand what people are going through, that actually is a positive aspect for leaders to have. The more empathy you have, the less likely you are seen uh, to derail in your career, which is great to have. So really think about the importance of empathy and how you can improve on those empathy skills.
But do you give enough time and attention to your direct reports? Do you hear the meaning behind what's being said? Are you paying attention to the nonverbals and the verbals in that, uh, in that person's message? Do you understand the person's perspective? And think about empathy in terms of that one-on-one -on -one interaction, and especially in terms of giving feedback. Do you practice that active listening aspect? Do you pay attention? Do you clarify? Do you summarize uh, what you hear? Do you share what you hear? So if you're a manager, I would totally recommend brushing up on your uh, empathy skills, becoming more empathetic. If you are someone who is helping develop other managers in your organization, I would definitely recommend having some sort of empathy skill-based training for your managers in your organization because it's going to definitely help predict whether or not they're going to derail and avoid derailment. One of the last key aspects there, as you see under empathy, there are gender differences. One of the cool things that we found in our study, yes, empathy does relate to derailment. The more empathy you have, you'll tend to uh, avoid derailment, which is great. But what we actually found was that relationship was actually stronger for women than it was for men. So we actually see that for women, empathy can help them even, uh, even better when it comes to avoiding derailment. It's important for men, but it's even more important for women as well. So from an individual uh, aspect, I've kind of given you some, some tips and some tricks and some tools to help you become a better leader and avoid derailment. But what can the organization do? And that's what I'm going to talk about next. Well, the one thing whenever I talk about leadership pipeline issues and what you need to do to address any sort of leader in your organization, whether it be the C-level executive or president or senior teams or the people at the entry level of frontline uh, supervisors, well, it's really about customization. And as Cindy McCauley says, be deliberate about providing experiences tailored to address the individual's most pressing development needs or to help them meet the role demands they are facing or will soon face. You know, so often we just give kind of off-the-shelf training and development to people and expect them to become better leaders because of that. But what we found in our research here at CCL is if the training and development, if it's not customized to the exact challenges that leaders face, to the exact needs that they need, where they are right now in their organization, in the leadership pipeline, in their life, wherever you want to look at in terms of customization, it's not going to stick. They really need content that is meaningful to them, that is useful to them, that really hits home to their challenges and what they're going through. If they're able to get that sort of content that's customized, it, it will stick, uh, it will be very effective for them, and they're going to be really great leaders going forward. So customization is one of the key things. Secondly, what else can organizations do? Well, we all know the phrase, absence makes the heart grow fonder. But what we've done in our research here at CCL, we've actually seen that absence of support makes the heart wander. We've seen through our research that managers who tend to feel like they are not supported by their boss and they are not supported by their organization, meaning that they don't feel like their organization supports them, develops them, that their organization or their boss doesn't care for them, doesn't care for their well-being, those types of managers will tend to want to leave their organization. Uh, we've seen that they are less satisfied in their jobs. We have seen that they are less committed to their organization. And we've seen that they have wanted to leave their organization. So organizations, what they need to do, what bosses need to do, what management needs to do, provide support, provide recognition, provide training and development opportunities. Tell the managers and leaders and individual contributors, anybody uh, who you want to not derail in your organization, just your whole organization in general, tell them how valued they are, they are valued people, and develop them, support them, uh, care for them and their well-being. Support will go a long way. Finally, uh, uh, well, another thing that we can do as well is to help these uh, managers give them uh, give them readings, give them all sorts of different ways to look at the newest thought leadership that's out there. We at CCL, we have the Leading Effectively website. We have all sorts of different um, topics that uh, managers can look at to get the newest thought leadership around what that topic is. You know, for uh, We even have a first-time manager tab for people who are managing for the first time. As we talked about before, 60% of managers aren't getting anything in, in terms of training and development when they step up into leadership. This might be a very useful way to help those people who are managing for the first time. But there are all sorts of different other categories that you can look at to help managers. What else should organizations do? Cindy McCauley here has also talked about this uh, in her work. Uh, she feels that people need to be realistic. You know, set the expectations around what leaders need to do, as, no matter where they are in the pipeline. Also understand that there's going to be risk. You know, in order to mitigate some of that risk, we need to have uh, strong support from the boss, 
strong support for the organization, for these high potentials, for these individual contributors who are stepping up in the leadership, for these people who are at the entry levels of your leadership pipeline. Uh, and we need to train them as well. And we also need to be aware of talent hoarding. You know, many people don't want to promote their high potentials in the leadership because they feel like they're going to lose something. They're going to lose their best performers. Well, organizations need to start thinking about what are some incentives for people to actually promote from within and what can we do to reward those people who are actually continually cultivating the talent in their, in their organization so that they don't feel like they're losing talent but they're going to gain something else by promoting that talent, those high potentials up in the leadership pipeline. So the last thing I want to uh, uh, talk about is the behaviors that we've talked about. Yes, if you display these behaviors, it will make a person more likely to derail. But, and this is kind of what I want to leave on a positive note, uh, it doesn't mean that you're bound to derail if you display those behaviors. It doesn't mean that you can never succeed. And it doesn't mean that you can't be successful someplace else. Because as we've seen with Marissa Marish, her career derailed at Google, yet she has become CEO of Yahoo uh, back in, I think it was 2012. So even though she derailed in her career before, she was able to find a great job later. But I do want to leave you with one last warning. Displaying those behaviors are going to make you derail, but it's not. it doesn't mean that you are hopeless and you can never make it again. However, if you are able to find a place that makes you successful, make sure that you understand that just because it happens once doesn't mean that it's never going to happen again. As you, can, uh, as you might have read in the news with Marissa Mayer, a lot of the things that uh, has affected her at Google has remained over at Yahoo, and she's had a lot of problems with her personal relationships. She's had a lot of problems with the board directors, with customers. Uh, Yahoo is still struggling right now. And a lot of those reasons, when you look at Marissa Mayer as the CEO, those same reasons that derailed her at Google are still coming into play at Yahoo. So just because you derailed once, you can find success elsewhere, but also make sure that if it uh, doesn't mean that it happens once, that it's never going to happen again because it can. So learn from your mistakes and learn from your past. So that's what I talked about in terms of Marissa Mayer as well. So uh, my closing thoughts before we take questions. Uh, I, I, I want to make sure that you have some clarity about the specific behaviors that need to be changed. You know, we talked about the five behaviors. When you give feedback to people, think about how those people display those behaviors. You can actually give them feedback on what they are doing and how they're displaying those derailment behaviors to get them off the track of derailment. Secondly, have a focus and a motivation to make those changes. For derailed managers uh, or for managers who might be on a track towards derailing, you need to think about how you can get off that track and that you actually can succeed and change your ways of, of thinking and doing things. And finally, gain support from the organization or from a development professional. You know, if, for, for managers out there, uh, ask for help. For so many of them who are managing for the first time, they don't get anything. So don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, it's only going to help you. And if you're in charge of developing and training your managers, try to give as much time and effort to people across your leadership pipeline, particularly that entry-level leadership, because as I said before, it's the biggest uh, psychological, emotional transition that you're ever going to make at work help them because the majority of them don't get help at all. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much, Bill. We've got some time for a few questions from our audience. Okay. We've uh, received a few of them. We've got a first one from Sean um, about uh, is it training um, people differently or shaking up how we do the training? Yeah, I think um, – it it's goes back to the point that I talked about before that, that Cindy McCauley has uh, said about, and we've done our research on, we've seen that customization is so important. So it's not necessarily training them differently. Yeah, I mean, you could have an online course. You can have, a, a, you know, these experientials. You can have, you know, these gaming systems that are out there now. Those are all going to be important uh, as, as time goes by, as, as technology gets better and better. But if we are not customizing that training development, to the actual needs of people, where they are in the organization, it's not going to stick. So when I talk about training for first-time managers, understand their challenges, understand what they're going through, the skills that they need to uh, 
to achieve to be a manager that is different than being an individual contributor. We've done all sorts of research around that. It's in the white papers, I think, that we have uh, that we have there uh, online. You can find out what those challenges are and model those developmental initiatives around those challenges for first-time managers. And then if, if you're linking, thinking about other people in your organization, different parts of your leadership pipeline, find out what they need and customize the training to that need. Thank you, Bill. Um, a comment from Carrie. Uh, she said four great questions that she asks and reviews with employees um, to build self-awareness is, am I a good fit for the role? Am I a good fit for the organization? Is the role a good fit for me? And is the organization a good fit for me? Exactly. So, you know, I, uh, before we talked about what are some things the individual can do to avoid derailment, one of the big things we talked about was self-awareness. And when we talked about self-awareness, it was all about fit. Do you fit in with the organization? Does the organization fit with you? Uh, Carrie's offered some really great questions for managers to think about themselves or for people who are helping develop those managers to, to have a conversation around fit. Good fit for the role, good fit for the org. Uh, is the role a good fit for me and is the organization a good fit for me? Excellent. Yeah, we have another question from Lucinda. What can we do in place of 360s for self-awareness? Um, their organization, they're not able to do uh, 360s because it become part of public yeah. So, again, 360s, again, uh, just to familiarize myself with it, 360s are ways that uh, if I'm a leader, I can rate myself on how well or poorly I'm doing in certain things. My boss can rate me, my peers can rate me, and my direct reports can rate me. You can get a 360 view of, of who you are and, and, and how effective or ineffective you are at certain things. Now, if 360s in that formal process uh, uh, much like Lucinda, not able to do that uh, in your organization. One of the big things that an individual manager can do is start setting the tone for feedback, asking for feedback, asking, you know, how well am I doing at this? Or I want to improve on this. Give me feedback on how well or poorly I am doing so I, because I want to get better. Uh, that is kind of the more uh, internal driven manager who wants to do that. When 360s aren't available, Go out and seek feedback for people. Tell people what you want to focus on. Tell people what you want to try to uh, accomplish in terms of becoming better at something. And tell people that you want their feedback on how well you are doing at that. Uh, for organizations, for people who are working with managers, tell them that they need to ask for that feedback. So encourage them to ask that feedback. And encourage them to give constructive feedback as well, because if managers are able to give feedback, uh, give good constructive feedback, they're going to develop a culture of feedback, which will help uh, with the flow of communication both upward and downward and around in terms of how well or poorly you're doing to get that sort of feedback to do well in your job. Okay, thanks. One last okay. question, Bill. Um, are some people best suited to remain at the individual contributor level? What can be done to develop and support these people? Yeah. You know, for individual contributors, we all hope that if, if somebody uh, gets a promotion and, and is, is and we give that, hey, you're about to become a supervisor, a manager, we would hope that that person would really want it with open arms and would, and would grab that opportunity. But as we know, a lot of people, they, they really don't. They, they, they really love their job that they're doing as an individual contributor, and they kind of shy away from leadership positions, even though the organization, the management team, think that might be the best thing for that person to do. It's really hard for, for some people to be talked into doing that. And for some people, they just completely say, no, I, I don't want to do that. But as we talked about before, support is going to be so important for them uh, to keep being a, a great individual contributor. So for individual contributors, we hope that they take that position, support them if they want to. But for those who don't, what are some other things you can do to help them, uh, you know, take on some leadership roles without becoming a leader? So one thing I talk about is become a mentor. Have them... Uh, become a mentor to uh, an up-and-coming uh, new employee or somebody who's a high potential. Uh, by mentoring them, that's not, that's not only going to help the person being mentored, but it's going to help that individual contributor who mentors as well. That's what our research here at CTL shows. It's a great thing to do that mentoring is just as good a gift to give as it is to receive. So for individual contributors who don't want to step up, have them take on a mentoring role. Uh, make sure also you support them and you develop them, give them recognition uh, for all the good things that they're doing. That's, going, that's what's going to keep them engaged at work and uh, avoid derailing at work as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Bill, for contributing to the Center's Leading Effectively webinar series and sharing how to help leaders with high potentials avoid derailment. 
Uh, we'll stay online for a few more minutes. If you have any other questions for Bill, please send them into the chat box. And we also invite you to participate in any of our live or on-demand webinars. You can access those through our website at ccl.org. Again, thank you for participating in today's webinar, and we look forward to having you join us for future sessions. Thank you.